Ask people to take their seats. Good afternoon, and welcome to the annual Healthcare Cost Growth Benchmark Hearing. This hearing is a key event for the Health Policy Commission, which we hold here at the State House with the chairs and members of the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing. Thank you first to Senate Chair Friedman and House Chair Lawn for hosting us here in the State House, and thank you to all who are here in person and who are watching online. Before we begin today's agenda, I'd like to recognize and welcome the members of the Health Policy Commission and ask each of you to introduce yourselves. And then after Senator Friedman and Representative Zlon's introduction, we'll ask the other legislators that are here to introduce those themselves. But if I could start with the members of the Health Policy Commission and perhaps begin with Commissioner Mastro Giovanni. Could you introduce yourself? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Mastro Giovanni, and I've been with the Health Policy Commission for a number of years now. And uh, one thing I can tell you about the commission, what a staff, and the work they do has been fantastic and has been truly helpful for everybody in the state in terms of being able to get that type of information and have that available. Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Blakeney. I am a nurse by education and background and I sit in the innovation seat at the commission, which means I help coordinate and lead the work on the innovation programs for things such as uh, midwife doulas, hypertension, and a lot of other programs such as that. Um, I've been on the commission close to five years now and uh, it's one of the pleasures and one of the most challenging uh, pieces of my life these days. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, good afternoon. I don't think this mic works. Even when he's still there. <laughs> there um, Tim Foley, I'm the Executive Vice President of 1199 SCIU, and I'm here representing the healthcare workforce on the commission. There you go. <laughs> good afternoon. I'm David Cutler. Um, eeks. My day job is Professor of Economics at Harvard. Um, I've been on the commission um, since it started in 2012, and I'm very, very pleased to have been able to contribute a bit and just echo everyone's thoughts about how important this job is today and what a, what a great position we're in to be able to have discussions like this. And I'm Deb DeVoe. I'm the chair of the Health Policy Commission in my second year, and I'm glad to say I've learned a lot over the last year. Kate Walsh, I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Marty Cohen, Vice Chair of the Commission on the Behavioral Health Representative. Hi, I'm Patty Haupt. I represent employer purchasers of health care, and I've been on the Commission a little over three years. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Alicia McGregor, um, Commissioner with expertise in consumer advocacy. My day job is a professor of health policy and politics at the Harvard Chan School, and my passion and interest is in maternal health, health systems, and health equity. So excited to contribute on this board. I'm Martha Kwasnick, um, General Counsel for ANF. I serve as Secretary Gorkowitz designee on behalf of the Executive Office for Administration and Finance. Mm -hmm. oh, Thank you. Thanks so much. And I'd also like to recognize um, Dr. Maddie Castile, another one of our commissioners who was unable to attend but who will be um, viewing the uh, presentation online. Before I turn to our legislative partners to introduce themselves, let me quickly review the goal of today's hearing and our agenda and format. Eleven years ago, Massachusetts became the first state in the country to establish a health care cost growth benchmark, an annual target for moderating the growth in healthcare spending. The benchmark is foundational to us achieving a more transparent, affordable, and equitable healthcare system to the benefit of all Massachusetts residents and employers, too many of whom are struggling with the cost of care. 
The purpose of today's hearing is to collect and present facts and data and to hear stakeholder testimony which will inform the HPC Board's decision about where to set the healthcare cost growth benchmark for calendar year 2025. By law, the benchmark is set at a default rate of 3.6% unless a modification is warranted and agreed to by the Board. This decision will be made at the HPC April Board meeting. So today's goal is to present the facts, hear testimony, and then we will um, make the decision in April. So our plan for today is first to hear a presentation on the growth in healthcare spending over the past year, which will be provided by the Center for Health Information Analysis, CHIA, in their annual report, as well as an analysis of those trends from HPC staff and the implications of the trends on affordability. So it's really one presentation in three parts, hopefully many of the um, questions that you have will be addressed through the three presentations, but we'll also look forward to taking questions as we go. We'll then hear from testifiers from many sectors of the healthcare system on whether modification of the healthcare cost growth benchmark from the default rate of 3.6% is appropriate. CHIA's annual report was released yesterday and detailed that healthcare spending increased 5.8% from 21, 2021 to 2022. This far exceeds the benchmark of 3.6% for that period. CHIA's latest year of data confirms the concerning trends we've been reporting on for the last few years. Healthcare costs continue to rise at a pace in excess of wage growth and continue to make healthcare increasingly unaffordable for Commonwealth residents. Rising health care costs have also been shown to directly affect access. We've reported previously that half of all Massachusetts adults are delaying or skipping necessary care due to cost, and 10% of adults were unable to pay for necessities like food, heat, or housing due to medical bills. While our health care system, especially our hospitals, are facing unprecedented challenges, we must continue to raise these issues and take action on rising health care costs as these unequal burdens persist across, across income, racial, and ethnic groups. I want to highlight that pharmaceuticals remain the biggest contributor to health care spending growth for the fourth year in a row, underscoring the need for action and increased oversight to address, understand, and, and act on pharmaceutical pricing and value. The HPC's role and mission is to contain health care costs while maintaining and increasing access to a high quality, affordable, and equitable health care system. We look forward to today's discussions and proceedings as the state considers the next steps on our health care reform journey. I do want to mention that we do not plan any formal break during the session today, so we encourage attendees and uh, the commissioners and legislators to just take a break as you need it. Um, and uh, we will plan to end by 3 o'clock. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Sydney, Cindy Friedman and Representative John Lawn chairs of the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing to provide their opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm Senator Cindy Friedman and as co-chair of the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Chair uh, Deborah Devo, DeVoe, David Seltz and the board and staff of the Health Policy Commission to Lauren Peters and the Center for Health Information and Analysis, true partners in uh, the work to uh, provide a affordable, accessible, and high quality healthcare system. I'd like to also welcome the House and Senate members of the Joint Committee for Healthcare Financing and other legislative colleagues in the audience. And to the patients and advocates, healthcare providers, and health plans who've joined us today to participate in this very important discussion. 
To say that this is an important topic that touches everyone in the Commonwealth does not do it justice. The healthcare cost growth benchmark, as you've heard, is a statewide spending target established by the legislature with the 212 omnibus healthcare cost containment bill, lovingly known as Chapter 224. The HPC must establish this benchmark annually, and the HPC board may modify the benchmark pursuant to a public hearing process and engagement with the legislature, and that is what we are doing here today. I look forward to hearing from HPC, from CHIA, and from healthcare stakeholders as we review how our healthcare system has responded to the end of the public health emergency funding support this past year. I also look forward to working with many of you in the weeks and months ahead on the pressing issues of healthcare cost, access, and quality, issues made all the more critical by the instability caused by profit-driven entities in our care delivery system. So again, welcome. Let me acknowledge um, my Senate and House colleagues uh, who are here today on the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing. And um, I do not see any senators currently with us. Um, so will I, I will allow um, Chair Lawn to introduce the um, House members who are here. Thank you, Senator Friedman. Um, and thank you, Deb, uh, and the Health Policy Commission, uh, David Self, Colleen, and your team. Uh, Lauren Peters and Chia and her team um, for your partnership um, in helping us um, as we try to advance the health policy um, in this state. <clears throat> I would like uh, to just briefly uh, acknowledge my House colleagues who are joining us today. Uh, we have Chris, Representative Christine Barber. Uh, we have Representative Hannah Kane who's joining on the live stream. We have uh, Representative Jack Lewis. Uh, Representative uh, Matt Maratori, Representative Brian Murray, uh, Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, Representative Steve Altrino, and we're just joined by Representative Chris Worrell. Uh, is that everybody, I think? I think we've got everybody. Um, I just have to make a couple of brief statements. Um, as we all know, there is great uncertainty and frustration within the healthcare sector today. Three years ago, we saw the generational health crisis of COVID-19 exacerbate an array of challenges we continue to recover from, including inflation, shift in patterns in care, supply chain issues, and workforce pressures. This has underscored the larger issues we see today, such as unacceptable health disparities that continue to persist in communities across the Commonwealth, including the beginnings of a pharmacy desert in underserved areas across the state. A workforce shortage that is leaving all health facilities completely understaffed and unable to function to their fullest potential. Community hospitals and health centers that continue to struggle, many forced to close services or are close to that outcome. Pharmacy prices that continue to escalate especially in the specialty drug area, threatening equal access to life-saving medications. Adding to these challenges, uncertainty created by the crisis at Stewart, many of our most vulnerable citizens are apprehensive about where they will be able to receive their health care. This places undue stress on other hospitals that are already overflowing with patients, which threatens equal access to a quality care. It seems as, as, as if these persistent headwinds we have seen in the past are still strong. COVID, however, did not create these challenges. It only underscores the mainly existing challenges in our increasingly complex healthcare system. This year, we are presented with a unique opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to our work in 2006 in 2012, and now a discussion turns on how to modernize our healthcare system to deal with today's pressures, pressing issues, and staying true to our ethos of shared responsibility. The progress we've made, such as universal coverage, expanding behavioral health options, and improving care for children, 
the elderly and the disabled and fostering a community of innovation has not been easy. With the need to continue to address equity and affordability, we know that that won't get easier. Yet, that cannot deter us from continuing down this path, and that is not the spirit that we have here in Massachusetts. We have never backed down from a fight because it seemed too complicated, or worse, it seemed as if we'd lose. Continuing along the current trajectory of healthcare cost growth that outpaces the rest of the economy is not only unsustainable, it shortchanges the rest of our priorities that we have here in Massachusetts, like education, transportation, clean energy, and beneficial environmental action. Looking forward, we must realize that there is no silver bullet to fix this, to achieve our goals of innovating with value-based coverage, expanding community-based care, and supporting our workforce while also tackling costs. We must prioritize a multi-pronged approach, healthcare policy from this moment forward. Anything that we must pass must address the inefficiencies, inefficiencies and equities in our health care. There is still much to be done, but the importance of this day in setting our cost growth benchmark for 2025 cannot go unnoticed as a big piece of that puzzle. So on behalf of my colleagues and the Joint Committee of Health Care Financing and myself, thank you for the opportunity to address you, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of the chairs. That sets the perfect uh, jumping off point for our presentation and discussion. And now I'd like to introduce uh, the Deputy Executive Director of the Health Policy Commission, Colleen Elstermeyer. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you to our HPC commissioners. We also want to thank um, Chair Friedman and Chair Lawn, and a special shout out to the legislative staff, the healthcare financing staff, for helping us put this hearing on today. As former legislative staffers, we know how much work you do and everything that goes into a hearing like today. So thank you so much. Um, again, yes, welcome everyone to our annual benchmark hearing. This is actually our eighth annual benchmark hearing for the first five years of the HPC's existence. It, we didn't have hearings because the default benchmark was set automatically to 3.6%. So interestingly, this is our, only our eighth annual benchmark hearing, but we have been here before today. Um, and we have met with you all in this building before today. So today we decided to do things a little bit different. We have a very, very brief, I promise very brief, video presentation for you today talking about the benchmark what it is, what it does, the process for setting it up, why we're all here today, the historical performance against the benchmark, and really what the impact has been of the benchmark over the past 11 years. So that's it for me for introductions. This video has been produced internally by our very talented HPC staff. Um, all of their names are listed on the last slide of the video presentation, and, it, and it's already published to our website, so if anybody wants to watch it again after this, please feel free. Um, and that's it for me. If we could um, please roll the video, I would appreciate it. Thank you. In 2012, Massachusetts passed into law landmark health care reforms, including establishing a first-in-the-nation benchmark or target for a sustainable rate of health care cost growth. The Massachusetts Health Policy Commission and the Center for Health Information and Analysis engage in an annual process to measure and monitor spending performance relative to this benchmark. The HPC is responsible for prospectively setting the benchmark for the following calendar year. CHIA is responsible for retrospectively reporting on the Commonwealth's performance against the benchmark. To promote accountability for meeting the benchmark, CHIA can also confidentially refer health plans and providers with excessive spending growth to the HPC for evaluation and the potential implementation of a performance improvement plan to reduce spending growth. Jointly with the state legislature, the HPC convenes an annual public hearing in March to consider data, information, and public testimony to inform the benchmark rate. Following this hearing, the HPC Board of Commissioners must vote to set the benchmark by April 15th. 
The benchmark is designed as a measurable goal for, not a cap on, healthcare spending, which allows the Commonwealth to track its progress and motivate collective action to moderate healthcare spending growth over time. State law prescribes a default benchmark rate in relation to a projection of the Commonwealth's long-term economic growth and gives the HPC board increasing discretion to modify the benchmark subject to legislative review. The benchmark was originally set by statute at 3.6% beginning in 2013. It was then lowered automatically to 3.1% in 2018 and rose again to 3.6% in 2023. The Commonwealth examines healthcare spending growth against the benchmark by calculating the change in total healthcare expenditures, or THCE. Growth in THCE was above the benchmark on average from 2017 to 2022, with prescription drugs and hospital outpatient services as the leading drivers of spending growth from private health plans in recent years. THCE is defined as the annual sum of all healthcare expenditures in the Commonwealth from both private and public sources, including Medicare and Medicaid. It is calculated on a per person basis to control for increases in healthcare spending due to population growth. CHIA calculates THCE using data from the state and federal governments, as well as data reported by health plans. CHIA also uses this data to identify and confidentially refer health plans and provider groups with excessive spending growth to the HPC for review and the potential implementation of a performance improvement plan. Now that we know what the benchmark is and how the Commonwealth has performed against it over time, what is the impact on the people of the Commonwealth? When healthcare spending outpaces growth in the overall economy, it produces ripple effects that exacerbate existing affordability challenges like high premiums and deductibles. As deductibles rise, families are at increased risk of medical debt and may forego necessary care. For example, in 2021, 46% of Massachusetts adults who were surveyed reported putting off medical care due to cost. Health outcomes suffer as a result, with widening disparities based on race, ethnicity, income, and other factors. The benchmark is an important tool to help mitigate the trend of rising healthcare costs, and maintaining and strengthening it could result in significant benefits over time. If healthcare spending grew at the target rate of 3.6%, rather than the current trajectory of 5.8%, family premiums and out-of-pocket spending would be 14% lower, with nearly $13,000 more in take-home pay per worker in Massachusetts by year 2030. Good afternoon, commissioners, legislators. I'm David Seltz, uh, the executive director of the Health Policy Commission. Uh, welcome today for this very important event on the modification of the healthcare cost growth benchmark hearing. Um, thank you to the team that prepared that great introductory video. Uh, I love the, the kind of jaunty music that plays. Um, and I hope that is just a, a quick reminder of, of, of the process and what we're here today to, um, uh, to collect information on. Um, I'm going to now switch to the slides in uh, your presentation. So if you go to your binders and there's a tab uh, that will say slides uh, towards the back, um, you can follow along with the presentation that will be displaying um, on the screen. All right, so we're going to um, jump right to slide nine um, in, in the presentations. We had some slides prior to that that just talked about what was covered in uh, the video. But on slide nine, you can see here just a timeline for this year's benchmark uh, modification process. So this uh, kicked off in January with the designation of the potential growth state product. Uh, this is uh, a measure of long-term economic growth in the Commonwealth, and it is set every year um, during the consensus revenue period process as an agreement between the House, the Senate, uh, and the administration. 
Uh, this year, um, as has been the case for the past 11 years, these um, three branches of government agreed to a 3.6% uh, measure of potential gross state product. This is important because this metric becomes the default rate um, for the benchmark as we move through this process. Today, March 14th, we're having, holding the public hearing. And on April 11th, the HPC board will meet um, in public session to consider uh, a vote to set the benchmark. If the board votes to set the benchmark at that default rate of 3.6%, uh, this annual process is complete. Um, if the board elects to modify the benchmark to a number below or above the default rate of 3.6%, um, that triggers additional uh, potential legislative review uh, as highlighted on the bottom part of this slide. Before, um, I'd like to invite uh, Lauren Peters and David Auerbach um, from the Center for Health Information and HPC to join us. Um, but before we do that, I just also wanted to um, reflect on the journey that we have made here in Massachusetts. Um, as Chair DeVoe said, in 2012, we were the first state to establish a healthcare cost growth benchmark. Uh, today, there are many other states that have joined Massachusetts in this journey of trying to moderate the growth of healthcare spending and promote affordability. As shown in the dark orange, these are the seven other states that have adopted healthcare cost growth targets and benchmarks. And as shown in the hash, uh, many other states are also pursuing strategies and policies to address healthcare spending growth that are um, consistent with recommendations that the Health Policy Commission has made. So once again, Massachusetts has been a national leader on this effort um, and also uh, an opportunity to learn from other states, um, some of whom have gone further than Massachusetts in evolving their approach. Um, I hope to be joined now by Warren and David Auerbach, um, who are uh, first going to turn to our partners at the Center for Health Information and Analysis uh, to present to this group um, some highlights and findings from the latest uh, annual report on the performance of the healthcare system. This report was just released yesterday, so this is um, very fresh new data. Um, and then I'm going to turn it to David Auerbach, our lead researcher at the HPC, who's going to take some of those same data points uh, that uh, Lauren will be presenting uh, and put them in a larger context, in a context over time, in a context compared to the United States, and also the implications of these trends on affordability. Uh, but first, it is really uh, my honor to turn it over to my friend and partner, uh, Director Peters um, from CHIA. Great, thank you, David. Good afternoon, Chair DeVoe, Chair Friedman, Chair Lawn, and other distinguished members of the legislature and HPC board. Thank you for the opportunity to present high-level findings from CHIA's 2024 annual report. This is CHIA's most cross-cutting publication that examines performance against the benchmark, as well as other key metrics, including costs, coverage, and quality. This year's report focuses on 2022, a period following two years of unprecedented volatility in our healthcare system. And while the findings should be viewed in this context, the report reveals persistent, long-standing trends, many of which predate the pandemic. So I'll begin with the state's performance relative to the 2022 cost growth benchmark, which was set at 3.1%. In 2022, total healthcare expenditures in Massachusetts increased to $71.7 .7 billion, equating to more than $10,000 per, resi $10, per resident, putting the per capita growth rate at 5.8%. Apart from 2021, this represents the highest one-year growth trend since measurement began in 2012. This trend includes state investment to support the financial stability of providers during the COVID-19 pandemic, these COVID-19 related supplemental payments totaling $621.5 million were paid by MassHealth to eligible providers pursuant to state and federal legislation. And while these investments were not insignificant, the valuation of these supplemental payments amount to less than 1% of the total 5.8% growth rate. Looking across 
the major payer categories presented on the slide, you'll see that we highlight the per member per month figures in addition to spending and enrollment trends. The per member per month values reflect the pronounced shifts in enrollment during this time period, notably increases in mass health and declines on the commercial side. So starting with the largest payer type, spending for private commercial members, including those with employer-sponsored insurance, unsubsidized individual purchasers, and connector care members, increased 4.1% on a per member per month basis, driven by a 0.7% increase in aggregate spending and a 3.2% decline in enrollment. For Mass Health, spending increased 1.7% PMPM, with aggregate spending growing 11.1% and enrollment increasing 9.2%, largely driven by federal Medicaid coverage requirements that were in effect during this time period. And finally, Medicare spending, which includes original Medicare and Medicare Advantage, increased 3.3% PMPM as spending increased 4.1%, while overall enrollment was essentially flat at 0.8%. The next slide provides a closer look at 2022 spending by healthcare service category. Looking first at hospital care, which totaled $25.3 billion, we see divergent trends by setting. Inpatient spending declined 1.4%, while outpatient spending increased 5%. Combined, spending for hospital services increased 1.8% from 21 to 22. After accounting for rebates that health plans receive from manu drug manufacturers, pharmacy spending grew by 8.3% and represented the largest driver of spending growth in 22. And when looking at gross pharmacy spending, in 2022, pharmacy spending surpassed hospital outpatient to become the largest individual service category. In contrast, spending for physician services, including primary care and specialists, was essentially flat, declining 0.1% from 21 to 2022, totaling $9.9 billion. And finally, non-claims, which refers to spending for health care outside of direct payments for specific services, grew 23.3%. As I mentioned on a prior slide, this was largely driven by the one-time COVID-19 supplemental payments MassHealth made to eligible providers pursuant to state and federal legislation. Turning now to how this healthcare spending, these healthcare, trends, healthcare spending trends are experienced by individual consumers and employers. This slide presents data on selected healthcare affordability measures. From 21 to 2022, monthly premiums in the commercial market rose 5.8%, averaging $595 per member per month, with premiums increasing between 5 and 6% for most market segments and this follows a 6.4% premium growth trend from the prior year. Cost sharing at the point of care, which includes co-pays, co-insurance, and deductibles, grew 6% to an average of $61 per member per month, surpassing pre-pandemic levels for the first time after two years of fluctuation as the utilization of healthcare services fell in 2020 and rebounded in 2021. We also highlight here that 42.4% of members with commercial insurance were enrolled in a high deductible health plan in 22, continuing a long-standing trend that has seen enrollment in these plans more than double over the past 10 years. These plans typically reflect lower premiums but greater levels of member cost sharing. The fastest growth in enrollment in high deductible plans has been among small group purchasers, reflecting employers with one to 50 employees. As Massachusetts residents experience rising premiums and cost-sharing responsibilities, especially as these costs outpace trends in wages and salaries, more and more individuals and families are forced to make difficult decisions, including delaying or foregoing necessary health care due to cost. In a 2021 CHIA survey, nearly one-third of Massachusetts residents reported that they or a family member went without health care services in the past 12 months due to the cost of care. And this was especially pronounced among residents identifying as Hispanic, Black, or other multiple races. 
Finally, CHIA's annual report examines trends in utilization and financial performance across a number of provider types. On this slide, we present some of the, these measures specific to acute care hospitals. In terms of utilization, the number of acute inpatient hospitalizations declined nearly 10 percent between 2019 and 2022, while the average length of stay has steadily risen. The increasing length of stay can be attributed to throughput challenges, such as placement in post-acute care settings, workforce shortages, and shifts in the type and severity of conditions, among other factors. And the impact of these trends can be seen in hospital financial measures. So in hospital fiscal year 22, the statewide median total margin was negative 4.2%. However, data through June 23 reflects a slight recovery with total median margins increasing to 1.6%. Total margins include both operating and non-operating activities. So when looking exclusively at operating margins, the trends followed a similar pattern. The statewide median operating margin was negative 1.3%, in hospital fiscal year 22, with a slight rebound to 0.2% in data through June 23. Underlying the negative margins that we saw in hospital fiscal year 22, and for the first time in recent history, we saw aggregate hospital expenses exceed revenues by nearly a half a billion dollars, with expenses increasing by 8.9%, or $3.2 billion, outpacing operating revenues, which increased by 5.5%, or $2 billion. To put this 8.9% expense increase into context, hospital expenses have typically grown roughly 3 to 5% year over year. This pronounced increase in fiscal year 22 can in part be attributed to temporary labor costs, which nearly doubled from $700 million in FY21 to $1.5 billion in FY22. In sum, the takeaway from all of these medians and aggregate figures is that while financial performance varied by hospital, the overarching trends were consistent across all four hospital cohorts, as all cohorts experienced negative median margins in fiscal year 22 and saw a slight recovery in their margins the following fiscal year. So with that, this concludes my presentation for today on a few of the key findings from CHIA's annual report. But more details, roughly 150 pages worth of details, <laughs> interactive dashboards and data books can be found on CHIA's website. So I will now turn it over to David for the next part of the presentation. Um, thank you, Director Peters, and I do want to reiterate your final point here, which there is a tremendous amount of, of really rich information on CHIA's website as part of this annual report release. We are so, um, so lucky in Massachusetts to have such an incredible, rich data uh, assets to be able to provide insights into what is happening in our healthcare system. As I talk to other states, every other state is so jealous of the fact that we have a CHIA. Um, and so thank you for you and your team's work. Um, as you mentioned, and as, as we've talked about, we're, many of the data points we're looking at here is from 2022. And, and this is a year where we still see um, ongoing impacts of the pandemic. As you just mentioned, there were temporary labor costs which really increased during this year. Um, and so um, for David Auerbach's presentation and for HPC, we wanted to try to put some of these numbers into a larger context and to think about them not just in a single year, but over multiple years to be able to identify those trends that are truly persistent over time so that may help inform what policy actions uh, we think are appropriate. So I'll turn it over to David Auerbach to talk a little bit about these same data um, in context. Does that reach anymore? Perfect. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. This talk will be in two broad parts. I'll talk about recent spending trends, as David mentioned, and then implications for affordability. Second. Excuse me. Um, yes. The acoustics in here are awful. It's not you. I wonder if you pull it closer to you. Would that? There's a real echo. I know. So you can hear it. I'm just. How's that? If I'm closer. Yeah. Okay. I will eat the I microphone. Know if it was, I didn't know so It's hard to, okay. Great, all right, let's go. So 
as we saw in the video, which ended on this slide. This is showing the 10 years now that we have of performance against the benchmark. And as was noted in the video, for the first five years, we were slightly below the benchmark on average. And for the most recent five years, from 2017 to 2022, our growth in spending was above the benchmark on average. So next I'm going to compare that to growth in healthcare spending across the United States. And what we see here is year by year, total healthcare spending growth in Massachusetts in the orange and in the US in the blue. And what you see is, for most of the years, really starting in 2010, we had slightly slower spending growth. Really all years but two since 2010. We've been slightly below the US average. And so putting that together, now I'll go back to not growth year by year, but the actual amount, the dollar amount of healthcare spending per person. Going back to 2009 on the left, you can see that in Massachusetts, our spending per person was substantially higher than in the US, about 36% higher. And as that has gone on over the years, going up to 2022, that slightly slower spending growth that we had has lowered the gap in terms of percentages. But since we started out so high in 2009, the dollars that we are spending has still, that gap has expanded. So by 2022, Massachusetts residents are spending 2,000 more on healthcare per person per year than in the US. It's about 10,000 as Lauren showed, DHCE per capita compared to 8,000 per year. Okay, and so keeping that in mind, that $2,000 gap, we then asked, which I don't have on a slide, what's contributing the most to that gap? What category of care? And more than half is in the hospital sector. About 1,100 of that $2,000 gap is from higher hospital spending in Massachusetts per resident. And about 500 is made up of higher spending on physician services per member. That's the bulk of the difference. Okay, now let's move to the commercial market where as Lauren showed, spending per member was about 4.1%. It was, it was higher than the benchmark last year. And that's been true the last few years. So here we're showing our commercial trend in Massachusetts in the orange and in the US in the blue. And again, we were below that US level from you know, 2013 through 2019. And then since then, we've been above. And there's this bouncy COVID pattern. So what I'm gonna do for most of the next slides is, as David said, smoothing that out to show you the 19 to 22 overall average. It'll be easier to compare. But in the big picture, our commercial growth from 19 to 22 was 4.9% per year on average. And the US average was 3.8. So a full point higher than the US average. And we're going to break that down. Where does that come from? But first, I just want to contrast that with the different sectors in Massachusetts. So as we showed, all healthcare spending, we've been growing a little bit slower than the US, but our commercial has been higher. So how does that all work out? And you kind of see it here. There's our commercial growth, 4.7%. This is the 19 to 22 three-year average. Mass Health is slightly negative, no growth, it's been flat. So that's really how we can be as a state below the US average, but our commercial is higher. There's a big difference. And our Medicare growth has been on the order of 3%. That's consistent with the national average. And you see the very big enrollment swings that Lauren mentioned in the orange below. And of course, that started to swing back as we've begun the redetermination in mass health. Okay, in this slide, I'm gonna show the drivers of that high commercial spending growth. What's contributing to that the most? So here, I'm breaking it down by category of care, 
and showing you not just 19 to 22 in the blue, but contrasting that with the previous few years, 2017 to 19 in the orange. So starting on the left, there's our overall commercial growth of 4.9% per year, faster than 2017 to 19. And then the next bar is showing the pharmacy growth, which is very high, much higher than that average. So the pharmacy growth really has been driving a lot of the spending growth. About a quarter of spending growth is due to pharmacy in the last three years at that 7% per year increase. Next category is office, urgent care, retail. These are our physician office visits. That's been growing more slowly than it was in the previous period. And that's where our primary care spending is. We've shown in other publications that primary care spending is, is not growing lately. It's very flat. And so as a percent of all of healthcare, it's shrinking. Um, and that's something we'll talk about more as the year goes on. Okay, and finally, we have our hospital category of 5.4% growth per year over the last three years. That's faster than 2017 to 19. And that broad category, I'll now show you, has some interesting trends within it. And we'll use our animation. There you go. So within hospital spending, you see different growth rates for the different parts of the hospital. The inpatient, the growth is slower, I think about 1.6% in the last three years. The hospital outpatient is 8%, much higher. Now, part of that, part of what you're seeing there is a bit of a shift from inpatient to outpatient. And we've shown before that, for example, joint replacement operations, knees, hips, used to be a standard inpatient procedure and about it's rapidly shifting to an outpatient day surgery. So that is some of that shift going on there, but that doesn't explain all of it. And then you see the ED spending trend, about 4%. Okay. So another way we break down the commercial spending trend, not just by category, but prices and utilization, use of care. And this pattern has continued that it's mostly about price increases. It's not about utilization. This is a large insurer that divides up their spending trend into unit cost, which is prices, and utilization in the blue. And you see that that price increase bar is bigger and bigger and bigger every year throughout this, the last seven years. The utilization bar is really not the driver. You see the COVID swings down in 20, up in 21, and a slight negative in 2022. So to to kind of accentuate that point, utilization going down or not being the driver. On this graph we're showing, as Lauren did, the trend in emergency department visits and hospital inpatient stays. And here we're going from 19 to 23. And you can see they're dropping. Emergency department stays are down 6% since 2019. And this data goes all the way up through September of 23 and total inpatient visits are down 7% since 2019. And we've subdivided those into a few categories. You see maternity stays are down 2%. You see the scheduled inpatient stays are down 17%. That's a lot of those knee replacement, hip replacement surgeries I've talked about. But even the admissions from the ED are about 6% down. And so I'm gonna spend the next couple of slides kind of staying on this theme because the capacity issues are a topic that's very, very much in the discussion lately. How can it be that ED visits and hospital stays are down yet we're having capacity issues? Um, and as an example of capacity problems, this slide is showing of people who come to the ED, what percent of them are there for more than 12 hours? It's related to the phenomenon of ED boarding. And this is the way we're measuring it. And you can see that has grown from 2019, 2021, 22, 23. That has grown. You see in the gold bars, if you're in the ED for a behavioral health issue, those rates of long stays we know are much higher. They are growing. But the rates of long stays are also growing for all other ED visits. That's in the orange. So there's that trend. Um, we're also seeing, as Lauren showed, increases in 
length of stay in the hospital. So you're staying longer in the ED, you're also staying longer when you're in the hospital. And this slide is breaking down that trend, which reveals some interesting patterns behind that. We're showing the hospital average length of stay, but based on where you then go after the hospital stay. The top bar is folks who then go to a skilled nursing facility after their hospital stay. The length of stay for those folks increased from seven to eight days from 2019 to 2023. For folks who are discharged to home health, again, about a one day increase in length of stay. For folks who are discharged home in the red, their length of stay is about the same. So the increase in the length of stay is mostly people who are then going to post-acute care or long-term care. And that is consistent with workforce problems, staffing problems, and issues in those post-acute care sites that we've seen. For example, we showed uh, at our advisory council meeting it, that the number of people employed in nursing facilities is still 20% below pre-pandemic. It has not come back at all. So this chart is sort of illustrating how capacity problems, you know, at the end of the, tra the chain, as you see on the bottom, some of those post-acute care sites can funnel back, create blockages on the inpatient side, even blockages on the ED side. And at the same time, delays in care in outpatient settings, starting from the top, can lead to avoidable ED visits. And again, you can see how this system that works as a, a number of intricately related parts can get, um, can get uh, blocked up and you can get long lengths of stay when the whole system isn't working well together. Further comment on that? Yeah. Thank you. I just want to pause on this slide um, because this is, this is a sobering reality of what we see in terms of challenges, uh, not just in the hospital setting, but really across the entire ecosystem of healthcare. Uh, when we think about in the community, in the post-acute settings, um, workforce challenges throughout. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge that in certain areas of the state, there are also real capacity challenges as well. And I'm thinking specifically of the southeastern part of the state. We in, in state government call that Region 5. Um, and it has been designated as a, as a high-risk area um, for capacity. Um, we know that some of that was due to uh, natural disasters, a fire and a flood. Um, and some of that has been due to what I would call corporate disasters. Um, the closure of, of Compass, um, and we know today, and I will acknowledge, the ongoing uh, extreme instability of the steward healthcare system, uh, which has a significant presence uh, in this part of the state. Uh, the ongoing um, challenges with steward will continue, have the potential to make this picture and this slide much, much worse. And that's why I do want to take this moment to acknowledge uh, Governor Healy and Secretary Walsh for your leadership uh, as the state navigates this uh, truly um, challenging situation of a healthcare system um, that has uh, not met its, its obligations to the state uh, or to the public and to find a path forward uh, that will maintain access to care for the patients that need it uh, and protect workers. And I want to thank you for your leadership. From the HPC side, we have um, uh, stepped up and, and tried to provide data and resources and staff and support uh, to you and to Commissioner Goldstein to help us plan uh, and proactively think about the future. Um, and uh, we're grateful for that partnership. Yeah, David, I'd like to thank you for always picking up the phone because you know why I'm calling. And, um, and Lauren and her team for the, the very strong data and analytics support, but also the um, just the, you know, kind of um, your understanding of the ecosystem, you know, as evidenced by this slide has been really enormously helpful to all of us as we navigate it. And look at my colleague down the, down the, down the, down the hall there, um, uh, both, uh, both the SEIU and m &A have been great partners with us as we've tried to work through this because in addition to caring for patients, there's jobs and the workforce shortage is, um, is you know, is a, is a big piece of this as well. And we want to make sure that people can do the work they want to do and are trained to do. 
So thanks to everybody. It's, a, it's definitely a team sport. And I'm only saying that because it's likely to get worse. But, <laughs> but. Okay, great. All right, so I'd like to come back to some of the drivers of the commercial spending growth that we've seen in the last few years. So as we highlighted before, most of that is about price, price increases. Here, this slide is focusing on prices for inpatient hospital stays. Over the last 10 years, we see that the average price paid by a commercial insurer for a hospital stay has grown 54%, which is twice as fast as the rate of inflation over this period of time, from about 14,000 per stay to 22,000 per stay. Oops. This slide is speaking to this high spending growth in the hospital outpatient department as another example. And here we're showing an example of one category within HOPD spending that's growing is drug infusions, which is a drug that is administered by a clinician. Um, it could be done in a hospital outpatient setting. It could be done safely in a physician office setting. And so here I'm contrasting how much that typically costs or how much insurers are paying in either setting. This is a case of the same drug where private insurers paid on average over $6,000 for this drug infusion episode in a hop D, more than twice as much as when that occurs in a physician office. And the hop D price can be as high as $13,000 compared to Medicare, again, paying about $3,000 for the same drug, same infusion. And now getting at one of the largest drivers, as we mentioned, prescription drugs. We've shown this graph year after year, and the average price for a branded prescription continues to go up. Total growth from 2017 to 2022 is 61% average branded price, and that's growth of 10% per year. This is not including rebates, but the growth would still be very high. And we're showing here on the bottom that 5% of these branded prescriptions exceed $6,000 in price in 2022. So that's the total price paid. We also see increases in the out-of-pocket payment that the patients pay directly for drugs like these. Here we're showing several classes of chronic conditions that patients have and the average out-of-pocket payment for the drugs they need for their conditions. And you can see in a couple of cases on the top, that's a doubling of how much patients pay out-of-pocket over these years from 2017 to 2022. There is slower growth for insulin you see on the bottom, which is a good example, probably influenced by federal legislation limiting that out-of-pocket, which seems to have spilled over to price decreases in the private sector. Okay, and finally, before I get to the affordability section, we want to highlight some of the costs on the insurer side. This graph is showing per person per year spending on premiums, the components of the premium that is not for the claims, but the additional administrative costs. These represent about 10% of the premium cost, and we're highlighting general administration costs on the left, broker commissions, and then profit and loss on the right. And you can see 50% growth in those general administrative costs over this period on the left. That includes insurer spending on claims processing, on IT systems, um, on care management costs, and things like that. And some of these costs are related to regulations um, through the Affordable Care Act on minimum loss ratio provisions. Okay. So that, that's the end of the spending trends section. And now we'll move into the section on implications for affordability. Are there any questions at this point? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just before you go, uh, sure. this couple of slides ago, you talked about the clinician-administered drugs, a significant driver of hospital outpatient spending yes. compared to offices. If the same drug was given in a physician's office. Same drug. What was the rationale for that? What's the reason do you think that is? 
sorry. I didn't and Dr. Hear. Auerbach, can you repeat the question also? Because why, why is that? Yeah. Why, yes, why, why is that? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Oh, oh, could you repeat the question? I, can, yes. you, can you play <laughs> you're, it back? You're asking why, why are we paying twice as much when that happens in a hospital right. outpatient department? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, what's happening is the a lot of we've shown before that a lot of services, for example, simple lab tests when they occur in a hospital versus an independent third-party site or a physician office, you're paying more. It's just the insurer provider negotiation where the hospital typically has more leverage to increase that price. And that's, that's really what's happening. So they will typically mark up those drugs, sometimes, sometimes 100%, sometimes more in those cases. Okay. Dr. Cutler, I have a question. No, go ahead. I'll get, let's get the acknowledging you. So I have a question. I think it's for both Lauren and David. Um, it's about the spending trends. So I think I can understand some of what's going on in Massachusetts, but I'm not sure I understand the comparison to the US. Because, so it, I was trying to remind myself. So we, 2022, we had still a very high inflation rate. So actually the growth was below inflation. And there was still some, probably some holdover in price increases that when inflation went up in 2021, it took a while for those to work their way through the system and so on. And then on the pharma side, if I recall, and I was just trying to search for it, if I recall, it, that was the year that was the really bad RSV respiratory year. And so there was a lot of drugs for respiratory illness, particularly in the winter of 22. So I kind of got, mm -hmm. there were a bunch of like temporary things in the data for 22 that made me think that even the 19 to 22 average was likely higher than the long-term average. And I guess I'm sort of wondering maybe, so, so that would incline me not to worry that much about that year because in overall inflation is down and we don't expect many more years with super bad respiratory illness and so on. But then I wondered why the U.S. then was above the national growth, because the national average would have faced the same thing there. So I'm sort of curious as to whether I should think, okay, it's, excuse, it's understandable what happened, because it was a bunch of temporary things, or whether I should think, yeah, but everyone else weathered those temporary things better than Massachusetts did. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know, we can't break down the national numbers in the same way to know all the components of why our growth was higher. Clearly, there is a commonality in the COVID phenomenon across. So I don't have a great answer as to why our growth was higher in the last three years. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. 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 Maybe do we know anything about volume versus price? No. No, I really don't. <laughs> Skilled nursing, you know, knee replacement, whatever. 
long-term care come forward and we'll come back. What do we do if that's the population that's old? Where's those costs going to escalate? How will they escalate? Yeah. That yeah. It's, it's a fantastic question, um, and I, I'd love to turn it over to Director Peters because she actually does a lot of work thinking about this particular part of the healthcare system. But I would say from the, the Health Policy Commission side, um, we hear a lot of the same things that you're hearing from your constituents. And we saw, we see in the data that employment in that sector, as David said, is still down 20% compared to a pre-pandemic. Uh, now some of that may be, um, you know, kind of some consolidation that we're seeing in that, that market, some closures, as you mentioned, in certain areas. Um, but uh, clearly from the data, um, there is, continues to be significant challenges. I don't know, uh, Director Peters, if you can speak to some of the work Gia does here. Sure, thank you. So I think the, the key trends that we're, we're really seeing is uh, occupancy rates have declined over the last couple of years, um, as well as overall utilization. So the, the total number of individuals going into a nursing home, um, resident, as we measure sort of resident days, that has declined over 16% um, since, since 2019. Now I know that doesn't sort of comport with what the calls that you're hearing, and, and really it is a function of staffing. It comes down to the fact that a facility could have 20% of their beds open and, and, and available, um, but they are not able to take on new residents because they don't have the staff to, to admit. So I think that the, the declining utilization and occupancy rates um, are, are reflective in, and when we look at the financial picture for long-term care facilities, um, that, that the finances, the margins are going to continue to decline as utilization and occupancy declines. Um, but it, it comes down to facilities being able to um, get the staffing in place to be able to take on new residents and sort of stabilize those occupancy numbers. Sure, I, I would just offer that rather, instead of thinking of it as a liability, I, I do think that there have been a lot of intentional efforts and investments made in moving away from institutional care and expanding home and community-based services that are available to, to residents. Um, and I think that this is something that this is not going to happen overnight, um, but I think it is something that, that policymakers need to be intentional about in terms of where they're putting investments and ensuring that individuals have an option outside of a nursing facility um, in the home and community setting. Yes. Hi, yes. <laughs> um, uh, so, like Representative Murtoy, I was also struck by the bar in Mr. Plot on page 31. Um, and I, I'm curious, it, it seems looking at it that if I were to think about health care spending, I would look at this and say, well, if we have more people going to hospital outpatient for the same treatment they could get in office, we're going to be spending more because it seems that you're telling me it costs more for that same treatment in that setting. Is that yes. fair? Mm -hmm. All right. So, We've also seen no shortage of news coverage. I can say anecdotally, I get from my constituents that um, there are, um, it's very difficult to get in to see your primary care physician right now. And so I would imagine that if you can't get in to see your PCP, you're going to hospital outpatient or acute care for some of these services that you would normally have gone to your doctor for. So I wonder, and I, I know this is a sort of hard research question to pose, but if that's a research question you've been posing, if the primary care shortage we're experiencing in this state is driving and what sort of, if, if there is any data to support that theory or if it's just a theory? Yeah, I would say where we definitely have some information and data on this is um, where people, uh, so first, the, the primary care access
access challenges are, are, are real. Um, we are working on a report specifically looking at primary care that we're going to come out later this year. One of the findings in that report is that uh, we looked at, this was a study that looked at 15 major metropolitan areas across the country, and Boston had the second worst wait times for a primary care visit. And in that study, uh, it, was, it was 40 days for a primary care visit. And I, I recently spoke to a group of family physicians, and all of the room said, 40 days? It's way longer than that. And, and so th this, the wait times that we're experiencing and people being able to access care in the community, we can track some of those people, um, and some of them are more likely to show up in an emergency department for care that doesn't need to be provided in an emergency department. So I see this as really kind of going back to that, that messy slide with all of the arrows, that this is an ecosystem challenge. And so it is absolutely understandable that patients who are having delays in being able to seek care in their community or their primary care are seeking other avenues to find that care. That is absolutely rational behavior, even if that may end up costing the system more. So when I think about potential solutions, it has to be kind of at every one of these different stages, uh, starting with the front door in the community and being able to invest in primary care. On this specific chart around um, hospital outpatient departments, interestingly, many patients may not even know that they're going to a hospital outpatient department. Um, some of these facilities look just like doctor's offices. They are sometimes not even connected to a hospital. Um, some of them are, are literally on the campus with the hospital, but many times they can be licensed under a hospital and just be in Waltham or in Foxborough and other places, and they're operating under a hospital license. So I don't know necessarily that patients are even aware sometimes that they're getting care under a hospital license and may be subject to higher copay cost sharing or co-insurance as a result of that choice. Um, we have made recommendations around uh, rationalizing um, some of these additional uh, hospital fees in these settings, um, but it is um, certainly a dynamic between kind of office settings and these settings. And we, when we see the data um, in Massachusetts, we have a lot of hospitals. Um, and our utilization of hospital outpatient departments is, is far above um, many other states. Okay. Um, so let's, let's move on to the, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes, Dave, Can you go to slide 34 working. and help me understand what I'm seeing? So there's a cap on administrative costs, right? Is that the, sorry, we're having. Sorry, that's the. The payer slide, the. Yeah, the health insured administrative costs. Yep. So there's a cap. It can only be a certain percentage, right? Only a certain percentage. Yeah. Yep. And I can't remember. Is it 13 percent or I can't remember? Seven percent? I can never remember. But anyway, yeah. this 53 percent increase is because the entire uh, cost has gone up. So their costs have gone up as well, right? So that's why we're seeing a 53 percent increase in the medical loss ratio, right? The, Medical costs are going up, so and so that's how they get to have a 53% increase, right? Yes. The, yes. Yeah. Math is correct. So that there is a medical loss ratio which ties, you know, the percentage for administrative and, and health insurance right. costs, but that's a percentage of the premium. And so as the premium goes up, uh, so too can that proportion okay. that goes to administrative costs go up. And this general administrative, just so I understand, is insurers. It's insurer based. It's not this administration. Is fully insured commercial health plans. plans. Okay. The broker commission, is that part of the 53? Does that get included in the, um, uh, in the cap, the MLR? I'm not sure if that's in the MLR calculation. We can, we can check that. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Okay. And then what's the profit and loss? I don't get what, what is that? Sh I mean, this is administrative costs have risen. Is this the profit and loss of insurers that, I don't, what, what, is, what is that? That's at the end of the day, you know, you have your premium revenue coming in, you have your administrative and claims costs going out, and you're left with a, a margin. It's, it's similar to when Lauren talks about the hospital margins, that's your margin at the end of how much surplus, how much profit. So works. the surplus, if you're a nonprofit, are going into reserves, and if you're a for-profit, it's going into your bottom line. And everybody, or there was a big loss in 2021, I assume, because everybody came back 
to get that, care. That's right. There's a gain in 2020 because spending was lower than they had anticipated, and the reverse happened in 2021. That's right. As to where that goes, I don't. I don't. I'm not an expert. Right, on but that I yet. mean, well, yeah. presumably, if you have a profit and you're a nonprofit, can't go into profit, right? Hopefully. Okay. Thank you. How you guys doing? Um, I represent the 5th Suffolk District where it's about 96% people of color. And in my district, there was three pharmacies that closed down. So my question is, uh, can we use all the payer claims database from at Chia uh, to monitor changes in prescriptions, volumes, and spending in communities that we see um, local pharmacies like the three that left mine closing down? That is something that we can absolutely look into for you. So we, we can follow up with your office. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All set? All right. Okay. And now in this final section, we'll talk about the implications of some is of these. Better yeah. Than, like, is it better from closer or farther? I'm not sure. <laughs> How's that? All right, thank you, perfect. Um, okay, so this slide, here we're tracking two years of growth in out-of-pocket costs, premiums that people face, and growth in wages and salaries, and how does that compare? And on this striking graph, you see a 26% increase in cost sharing from 2020 to 2022. Of course, the 2020 to 2021 rise is unusual, we were coming out of the pandemic, everything grew. But I'll note that even from 21 to two, cost sharing and premiums for fully insured did grow faster than wages and salaries on that bottom line that you see there. Okay, so keep that in mind and we'll come back to the implications of this sort of growth. Here we're showing the quarterly premium trend in the merged market, which is mostly the small group market and in the individual market as well. And you can see those rate increases, which are essentially the premium increases before people maybe raise their deductibles and try to avoid those premium increases. They've been tending in the six, seven, eight percent increase range over the last few years, higher than earlier in this period. And one of the implications of that, we are tracking this year after year and we continue to see the number of people getting health insurance through small employers has dropped year after year after year, and it's almost about half of what it was in 2010. And at the same time, you see a doubling in the percentage who have high deductible plans. It's three and four, 75% in 2022. And that's coming along with a 50% increase in premiums. Even with that shifting of the costs to the member, even then the premiums have risen 50% over this period and you see that market shrinking year after year. And just to highlight premiums in the full market now, not just the small groups. Again, we talk about premium averages. 23,000 per year was the average cost of family coverage in 2022. And many people are paying much more than that. Um, you can see on the left, um, about a quarter of the market had a family premium of more than $27,000 a year, 10% of folks at a premium over $31,000 a year. And again, that highest 10% on the right is the deductibles, 10% facing deductibles of more than $7,000 per year for family coverage. That's much higher than it has been in recent years. And as Lauren mentioned, you can see the trend in the percentage of all residents with private coverage that have a high deductible plan. And it has grown every single year since 2013, and now it's at about 42%. And if you remove members with the insurance for the GIC, it's almost half, almost half of all people have a high deductible plan by now. And we know that, as we've shown before, when you have a high deductible plan, you're much more likely to avoid care. You don't want to face that medical debt, you don't want to face that out of pocket. And that rate of avoidance is especially high for people with lower income, of course, and people 
who are racial and ethnic minorities, we also see higher rates of avoidance of care. So I'll just now bring this back in the last couple of slides to a, a very typical scenario of what it looks like for a family facing a premium increase that's faster than their wage increase. And so in this scenario, I'm choosing a, a typical family with average median income in Massachusetts in 2021, 2022, and their employer is offering them a 3% raise in the next year. And that's about average wage increases over the last three years. That's a typical scenario, 3%. And so how much of that raise does the family actually get at the end of the day, after taxes, after health insurance, in their pocket per month? I'm going to show this for two different scenarios. First, the scenario where health insurance costs also go up 3%, same as your wage. Scenario two, kind of the experience of 2022. What happens when health insurance costs go up 8%? Again, that's a typical, that's what we saw in the small group market, that's what we saw in the merge market for premiums and cost sharing. And so what happens? So starting in the bar on the left, that's your wage, that's what your out-of-pocket take-home would be from that wage increase before factoring in healthcare. So that family's getting $227 per month added to their paycheck that they can spend on what they need. In that scenario one now, moving over there, the 3% healthcare increase is now bringing that down to, sorry, I think it's $188 per month. Okay, so from 227 to now I get $188 per month. Okay, that's what you get with that 3% healthcare increase and the rest of that goes to the healthcare cost. And now in scenario two, very common scenario in 2022, that 8% healthcare increase erodes almost half of my take-home pay, and the family just gets $123 per month. And they're using that to cover price increases elsewhere. My, my daycare might have gone up, my housing might have gone up, everything else in the economy. And some people are left even worse off than they were before with that raise. So again, this is not a crazy scenario. This is very typical, what happened in 2022, and is underlying a lot of the cost of living, the difficulties that families are having making ends meet when healthcare cost rises that much. Okay. And now David's gonna tell us how to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so these, these unsustainable trends threaten our goals as a commonwealth. You know, our goals around competitiveness, equity, and affordability. We've heard the governor speak about those three goals again and again. And this slide shows how rising healthcare costs challenge our ability to meet that. And as I sit here before you, I worry that unless there is action uh, to strengthen our, some of our tools and our approach here, um, that these trends will continue to go in the wrong direction and that we will be left with an increasingly more unaffordable uh, and inaccessible and inequitable healthcare system. So we've put forward um, a list, uh, a prescription for our healthcare system. A comprehensive set of policy recommendations included here and detailed uh, more fully in our annual cost trends report. Uh, I will not go through all nine of them uh, today, um, but I do want to highlight that many of these recommendations speak to the challenges that we've heard about already today. For example, we have a recommendation around enhancing oversight of our pharmaceutical spending. We saw that pharmaceutical spending was the number one biggest driver of healthcare spending over the last two years. There are tools that we can put in place to increase transparency and accountability in this sector, uh, and by the sector, I mean both manufacturers and pharmacy benefit man manufacturers, um, and to um, be able to open the black box of what's happening uh, in pharmacy. Um, we mentioned concerns about hospital outpatient department growth. Um, under our recommendation number two, we have some recommendations around rationalizing some of those, what we call facility fees. We talked about um, the challenges in the workforce and how that is playing out in terms of capacity challenges across the system. We have recommendation number eight around supporting and investing in our workforce. And number seven, around being able to monitor and understand the changing supply and distribution of services. We've heard about potential closures and consolidations and then sometimes expansions. What are the impacts of these? Um, but I'll spend the next uh, three minutes focusing on recommendation number one which is around modernizing our approach to 
emphasize affordability and health equity in our healthcare cost growth benchmark. So this recommendation number one is really reflecting on the last 10 years of experience, 11 years of experience at the HPC, and an opportunity, um, and I should say an, maybe an imperative, um, that there be legislative action to update our approach. So here we have three sub-recommendations around strengthening the healthcare cost growth benchmark, uh, establishing new affordability and health equity benchmarks. First, on strengthening the healthcare cost growth benchmark on slide 45. Um, we first make a recommendation that we should have additional metrics um, by which CHIA uh, can make referrals to the Health Policy Commission in our review of a potential performance improvement plan. Right now, there is a sole metric uh, defined in law uh, that only uh, includes provider groups that have primary care physicians within them. Now, many of our biggest health systems have primary care physicians within them. Um, but what this excludes is things like specialists or long-term care or actually even hospitals themselves which don't have primary care physicians within their four walls. Um, these entities are not referred to the HPC for review under the current definitions. The second is to provide more nuance about how different providers are referred to the HPC for review. Right now, it's a bright line test. If your spending goes above uh, the benchmark rate, you're referred to the HPC for review. But we know that there are very significant differences in the context of these providers. What patients do they serve? What populations? Are they taking a, bunch of, uh, a lot of public payer patients? Um, what is their relative price compared to others? All of these factors may weigh in favor or against uh, whether we should be concerned. And so we would propose to provide a little bit more flexibility to CHIA to front load the idea that there is variation and that we should not be treating all providers the same when thinking about accountability. The third is around transparency. The review and referral process for a performance and improvement plan is a confidential process and it has been that way for 11 years. Let's open that up to the public so the public can see and understand which providers and health plans are exceeding the benchmark in any given year. And finally, uh, there may be an opportunity to uh, strengthen the financial penalties to ensure compliance with the benchmark. On the final slide of today's presentation, I want to highlight an opportunity to go beyond the healthcare cost growth benchmark and to think about the other values that we want to track and improve, specifically around affordability and health equity. So we see an opportunity here to complement the healthcare cost growth benchmark by establishing an affordability benchmark or an affordability index that will be much more focused on consumers' and employers' experience of healthcare spending, not just total healthcare expenditure growth as we heard earlier today, but how are people feeling their premiums and deductibles and cost sharing going up? Let's track that transparently so that we can improve it. The second is round health equity. We know that there are long-standing inequities in access and health outcomes. Um, we can't improve something unless we measure it and track it. And so we would propose to, again, complement our goals around cost by bringing in concepts of health equity and to work together across state agencies to uh, define what those targets and goals may be and then motivate collective action to them. On both of these sub-recommendations, uh, we do hope that the legislature would consider amending our statutes to uh, codify these concepts. Um, but I will say uh, for the HPC, we believe we can move forward with putting forward some affordability metrics right now and to have that be transparent. So we're working with CHIA on um, what, what would an affordability benchmark look like? What could that metrics be? Um, that's a goal for this year. And with health equity, I would um, want to acknowledge the leadership of, again, Secretary Walsh and EOHHS who have put forward an action plan about advancing health equity in Massachusetts. Ahem. And this uh, interagency task force is focusing on specific areas targeted to reduce health inequities. And I think that group could be a real source for thinking about how do we set goals statewide and how do we track our, our improvement over time. We at the HPC look forward to working with you legislatures to advance these recommendations and others. And as always, on behalf of, of CHI and HPC, we are a resource to you.
Um, so thank you for your attention for our presentation. We're happy to open it up to, to further questions uh, before we turn to public testimony. Thank you. Question? Thank you, David. Um, one question I just wanted, if we could dive a little bit deeper into the support and invest in the Commonwealth's healthcare uh, workforce. We know that, you know, and Senator Friedman has been a long proponent of um, enhancing primary care and access, but we also know that we have a real challenge of the amount of primary care doctors. Um, and I just don't see how we, we get there without really investing in people here in Massachusetts to go into primary care, incentivize them to stay in it. Um, because we know, I think one of the stat I saw was only 40%, I think in Massachusetts residents even have a primary care physician, and I would even think that number is going down while we're trying to increase more access. We know that so many people are using our ED uh, when they need health care instead of going to a primary care because they can't get in, as you mentioned earlier, and I think that wait times are much longer than uh, what was reported, as we all know, when you try to call a primary care physician and with the closures of many of these um, other primary care physician groups. So I, I, I just trying to like figure out how do we really expand our primary care access when we really don't have enough primary care doctors and we don't see, we can't produce them uh, without a really long-term strategy uh, to do that. And I think that's where, you know, when we see all the other workflow issues and so many of the bottlenecks we know um, you know, the bottleneck stuff is, is really a challenge f through the workforce. So um, how do we do that? Yeah. Uh, it's a fantastic question. And I think, unfortunately, you're highlighting a, a really sobering reality. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're working on a, um, a report that will come out later this spring, specifically looking at the primary care workforce in Massachusetts and some of the challenges. And what we see in the data, and I can share this, um, the rate of, of medical residents who are choosing to go into family medicine or internal medicine is very small and in some cases declining compared to some a lot of specialty um, uh, um, practices. And so people are, the residents are choosing not to go into these, you know, into these categories of care. And some of that is very rational because a lot of these primary care physicians get paid less than the specialists. And so we are getting what we pay for in terms of our healthcare system. We're not prioritizing primary care, and yet we expect to get more <coughs> primary care physicians. So one of the things that um, I come back to is the, the decreasing proportion of the healthcare dollar that's going to primary care. You spend seven cents of, a health, of the healthcare dollar on primary care in Massachusetts, and that percentage is going down. So I do think we need to change the financing of the system to make primary care more attractive to residents at that front door, and then to keep people in practice longer. We're getting increasingly burnt out by administrative complexity and burden that is also being placed on them. So I think there's an opportunity to address uh, unnecessary administrative processes and burdens that we place on primary care physicians. I also think there's an opportunity to think beyond primary care physicians and think about nurse practitioners and other types of groups, um, uh, prof medical professionals, that can help fill some of these roles. Um, but it is a, a multifactorial challenge and one that um, when we look at the data and evidence across the world, health systems that have a strong primary care foundation tend to have lower costs and better health outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, good. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, thank you all for, it's always fascinating. I'm, I'm like Steve, been here eight years following us. It's just fascinating. <laughs> um, Director Peters, just one quick question for you, then I have an overall question for all of you. On the commercial enrollment, I see that's going down. Do we have a rationale why we think enrollment is going down in commercial sector? Is it because of cost or? Sure. So or switching to the switching to the state program. Sure. So so during this time period, um, 2022 was was right in the middle of the pandemic, um, and the federal Medicaid coverage requirements were still in effect. Um, so essentially, through the nor the normal churn of redeterminations had paused. So what we we 
can attribute some of the increases to mass health and declines on the commercial enrollment side to these these federal coverage requirements. So individuals that would have otherwise sort of been redetermined off of mass health and moved into the commercial market, that did not occur for from 2020 to 20, April 2023. Um, so I, I think that that is a large component okay. of it. Okay. We, as a subsector of the commercial market, includes the connector care, um, which is a subsidized program. And, and that is where we've seen sort of a large population or a large group of the folks, once redeterminations resumed, we saw a large number of folks go from Mass Health, um, move over to the Connector Care program. So I think the 2023 enrollment data will be, um, will be able to sort of confirm some of these shifts in enrollment once the federal coverage requirement was lifted. Thank you. And uh, just a comment on your long-term care as well. You're absolutely right. It's, and we've had these conversations in the past. It's, it is staffing that's causing the issue. Um, but it, but it, I have to put a plug in, too. It's, it's also the mass health rates. Even though they've gone up over the years pretty good, it's still a problem because when, you have, when they do have long-term beds, and they're not supposed to do this, but a lot of them will say, well, we really don't have long-term beds because they're waiting for the Medicare you know, the Medicare person to come in, which pays twice as much as Mass Health, or the private pay that pays, you know, you know mo almost more than half of that. So that, that's some of it as well. So I think we still need to do some work with the Mass Health rates to kind of help with that as well. And then that will help with the trying to get more staff in as well. The rates of staff have gone up, which is nice, but I don't think we're quite there yet. That's just my personal opinion. The last question I have is uh, the impact on telehealth. Can you comment on that, pros, cons, how is it working, not working, and what can we do to improve on that? Do you have any, an update on that from here? Sure. So I could say generally, the, the trends that we saw throughout the course of the pandemic, telehealth really spiked in 2020, um, and then it started to wane, the utilization and, and therefore spending started to wane 2021, 2020, and through 2022. So we're, we're seeing sort of a, a slow decline in the utilization spending on telehealth services. I will say the one sort of promising area is that behavioral health delivered through telehealth modalities um, has sustained. And, and so that is one area that um, has proven success, one of the, the silver linings of the pandemic. Um, so that, that is an area that we are able to break out in our spending numbers to identify what's, what is the utilization rate, what service categories are being provided through telehealth, um, and that is something that we plan to continue to monitor and track over time. Yeah. I had a question and, and then a comment, and actually my first question is related to the most recent question around telehealth, um, because I wondered whether the outpatient numbers, so the care received in urgent care settings, the care received in um, physicians' offices, whether telehealth was included in that, those numbers or whether telehealth was separate, because that can also help us to make sense of sort of what was going on with uh, pharmaceuticals in these last couple of years where we faced um, unusual circumstances. So. Um, related to Dr. Cutler's question around um, the increasing use of pharmaceuticals for um, specific health issues. I'm, I'm thinking of COVID in particular. Um, it's very easy in Massachusetts to get a prescription of Paxlovid via telehealth. Um, to, to what extent um, can we better understand the, um, the extent to which it, the spike in telehealth use might be also driving up uh, pharmaceutical use and pharmaceutical spending. Do we have a sense of that? And then my second question, and, and really comment, is, is just around the, the huge increases we've seen in growth in um, the out-of-pocket costs that um, individuals and families face, and, and that really stops me dead in my tracks um, whenever I read it. Um, that's something that, as someone who studies health systems, you know, we know that one of the most important indicators of a health system's performance is its ability to protect um, individuals from financial risk, right? So financial risk protection 
is uh, extremely important in determining how well a health system is performing. And so in that regard, I think we should all be very concerned and frankly, we should be losing sleep at night uh, because of what we see in Massachusetts. Um, and finally, with respect to, to equity, um, the, the figures around the percentage of, of residents of the Commonwealth who are avoiding care or who have unmet needs due to, um, due to the costs and anticipated costs, um, I wonder, are you able to sort of um, disaggregate that by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status? In I know I know that you are, and you've you've um, you've shared that figure today. But are you able to um, determine how much of that is due to cost sharing and, and variation in cost sharing by race, ethnicity? So I'll take the, the last point first, and then maybe turn to. Director Peters and David on, on the telehealth question. So on the, the survey data that we showed in the video, around 46% of Massachusetts adults reporting that they did not get the care that they needed or delayed care due to the cost of care. Uh, we can actually break that down by race and ethnicity. So that 46% is an average of all Massachusetts adults. Um, black residents in Massachusetts, um, that figure jumps to 66%. And Hispanic residents, it jumps to 60%. So there is, that average is masking a significant disparity underneath that. Um, and I think we could do some more work to try to understand, um, is it the deductible, is it the cost sharing, are there differentials in cost sharing that we're seeing too um, by some of these groups that may be, may be driving that. Um, but we, we see it in the numbers um, uh, plainly. Um, and thank you for that question. I'll turn it over to these guys to see if anything can, you can add on top. Can I just add one thing on that? Sorry. Just, and geography. I mean, I think it goes yeah. to the representative's question earlier about services closing in certain areas as well. So when you're looking at that deaggregation of the data, is there geographic areas uh, that are that shine through when you look do that analysis for that group in, in yeah. particular? Geographic income, I think those are all areas we can look into. So just to respond to the telehealth question, we measured telehealth sort of depending on, it, it really depends on the provider type and setting that was provided, that was providing that, those telehealth services. Um, that, that would determine which spending category, whether it was hospital inpatient, hospital outpatient, um, whether it was other professional physician services. Uh, so I think that the telehealth was, it, it was embedded within each of those service categories, and, and to the specific question about how much did increases in telehealth drive some of the increases um, in pharmacy spending, I, I would say very little in this, to the extent that the pharmacy trends that we've seen over time have continued. They, they predated the pandemic. They predated this sharp uptick in utilization of telehealth services. Um, so I, I don't think that there is a, a strong correlation, if any, really, with the use of telehealth. I agree with, with Lauren on that. In our, in our mandated telehealth report, we did an analysis to ask them very specifically, do we think telehealth raised total spending? And we did some before and after work. And we found that, with the exception of in behavioral health care, where it looks like it was related to some additional utilization, we didn't see an impact on, on total spending. And to your other questions, I just want to put in a plug for, for Chia. Their 2023 health interview survey will be out soon, and it has a lot of the detail on why are you avoiding cost, what kinds of care are you avoiding, what are the reasons underlying that, with all of the geography and race ethnicity there. So that'll be re really rich data to answer that. Great. Thank you. One second. This has been a terrific set of presentations and discussion. I'm going to suggest, since there are other questions from the legislators and commissioners, that we pause on those to move to the public testimony and then come back, because we did give those who plan to testify a time frame to come and be with us, and I want to just respect that. But please, um, let's uh, plan to come back to what I know are some additional questions from the commissioners and legislators. And thank you so much for the presentations. So now turning to our public testimony, 
And I would ask that each individual who's testifying come down and uh, sit at the front table with us. Our first uh, individual is Alex Sheff from Healthcare for All. Welcome. Sure. Okay. I've never been more afraid of a microphone now. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, uh, thank you. Um, so, my name is Alex Sheff. I'm a Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations uh, at Healthcare for All. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I think you all, uh, most of you know, we operate a helpline that takes around 20,000 calls a year, um, and uh, we advocate for health justice in Massachusetts uh, by working to promote health equity and ensure coverage and access for all. Right now, we have dueling health care challenges in Massachusetts. Too many residents, particularly people of color and low-income individuals, are not able to afford the care they need and too many are not able to access that care. When residents can't afford care, it not only leads to financial stress, but also poor health outcomes. And at the same time, if residents get stuck uh, or, or can't see a primary care doctor or are stuck boarding in an emergency room, it also leads to bad health outcomes. We are here every day uh, from residents in both of these predicaments on our helpline. We, uh, we must confront the pressing challenges that Massachusetts faces when it comes to access to care uh, that's driven by misaligned incentives, uh, workforce challenges, uh, and bottlenecks in the system. As we do, it's critical that we focus on the communities that have too often been left without access to the care they need and the types of healthcare services that have been underfunded. We should focus on redirecting resources and changing payment structures for primary care and behavioral health. Several pressure points uh, in emergency departments and hospitals could be relieved by better access to primary care, to your question. Um, and uh, and, and uh, the same is true for behavioral health services, both in the community and through inpatient and step-down psychiatric uh, care. Expanded access to these services can help to manage care both up and downstream. We should also focus on ensuring access to care in low-income communities and communities of color that have too often been marginalized and underserved. To do that, we need to adjust the incentives in our system to encourage investment in expanded services in communities that have lower rates of commercially uh, insured residents and that don't draw proposals for expansions as frequently as whiter and wealthier communities with higher rates of commercially insured residents. We also have to focus on language access, especially uh, for primary care. This is something we hear about uh, as, as much as anything on the helpline, and progress will require uh, ensuring that practices are living up to their uh, expectations while expanding workforce and training and building pipelines to diversify the workforce. As we work to address these challenges, we can't take our eye off the ball for residents across the state who are struggling to afford the care they need. With regard to the role of the benchmark in ensuring care is affordable, it's critical that the HPC consider the context in which people are experiencing these costs. We should strive to keep healthcare costs in line with the income that individuals and families have to pay for those costs, and we've seen some great data on that. This year's CHIA report um, uh, once again found that health care costs that consumers face, premiums that rose 5.8 percent and out-of-pocket costs that rose 6 percent, outpaced both commercial spending and wage growth. Considering wages is one factor, um, you know, as one factor when setting the benchmark, uh, is actually an approach that California recently proposed as they're charting the course for their uh, health care cost growth benchmark. It uh, seems logical that we should consider it as one factor here as well. And in 2023, uh, wages in Massachusetts grew approximately 3.4% from the previous year. That aligns with our recommendation that this year the benchmark uh, should be set between 3.1 and 3.6% consistent with previous benchmarks. We also need to continue to think about ways to iterate 
both through administrative and legislative channels on the benchmark process based on uh, our more than 10 years of experience and the progress of other states like California and others that have made uh, progress in the intervening years. Our benchmark system has seen great successes, but as noted, it has waned in impact in recent years and there are areas where modest but critical updates could be enormously helpful. That starts with uh, bringing prescription drugs into the benchmark process by enabling the Health Policy Commission to conduct cost reviews of high cost drugs when their cost and value may not be aligned. Drug costs stand out in the CHIA report as the largest driver of increasing spending in the state, rising at 8.3% even when adjusted for rebates. It also became the single largest category of spending, surpassing even hospital outpatient department spending this year. We simply cannot, cannot address our health care affordability in the state without addressing the cost of prescription drugs. It also requires um, some updates here around flexibility in the measures, as David pointed out, that can be used to refer entities to the PIP review process as it relates to hospital costs and prices and um, requiring stronger accountability through more meaningful penalties for uh, non-compliance in data reporting and spending over the benchmark. Finally, it requires uh, tackling, spotlighting, um, and having direct accountability for the costs consumers face uh, through an affordability benchmark or index and um, so that people across the Commonwealth are protected. We are extremely excited to see the Health Policy Commission take steps to begin implementing an affordability index as part of the annual cost trends process. We also uh, are hopeful that it can be implemented in concert with an equity benchmark uh, or index that will likely consider factors outside of costs uh, that uh, highlight the intersection with healthcare cost and equity. We look forward uh, to partnering with the HPC and other stakeholders to help design the affordability index in a way that enhances uh, overall accountability for system costs while uh, tracking how individuals and families and businesses of all types experience those costs. I'll stop there and thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. from the Massachusetts Hospital Association. I think what we're learning is that we need the mic on for those who are listening um, on the streaming, but not speaking right into it avoids the echo, Steve. I'll do my best to use the mic. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Friedman, Chair Lawn, Chair DeVoe. Secretary Walsh, members of the Health Policy Commission. I'm Steve Walsh, President and CEO of the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. The year was 2021. January 12th, 2021, specifically, was the day that we had the most COVID deaths in the United States. That's the year we're talking about. Tomorrow, four years ago, the United States shut down, March 15th, 2020. It's hard to measure trends over the past four years. The country closed, but hospitals stayed open and haven't closed since. Now, if I do look at some of the numbers that are presented, I was encouraged to see that hospital expenses grew at a rate well under the cost growth benchmark from 2021 to 2022, 1.8%. But again, I won't cherry pick only the number that makes hospitals look good because it's hard to accept any trends in healthcare over this time. This benchmark is just one piece of a much larger puzzle. And this hearing comes in a moment of deep crisis, deep fragility, an extraordinary change for the Commonwealth's health care system. Despite all of your and all of our best efforts, our provider community has shown almost no signs of recovery in the last four years. The Commonwealth's growth rate, like all economic measures, will rise and it will fall. 
California was mentioned, providers in other states are considering similar measures. And some are suggesting they need a benchmark much higher to meet inflationary pressures. That's not our request. It's not why we're here today. But I do have a request. As you pour over the thousands of metrics contained within CHIA and HPC's annual reports, I ask that you think about some metrics that really matter and keep them top of mind. 19,000 job vacancies across Massachusetts hospitals. 1,500 patients stuck in hospitals because they cannot access specialized care that they need. One in seven med surge beds currently tied up with patients who no longer need acute level care but can't be moved. All five regions of the state at elevated risk at this moment because of capacity constraints. Nine local hospitals, immediate future is in doubt. 20% of behavioral health beds offline due to staffing shortages. $24 million being lost every single day because of the cyber attack with Change Healthcare. And 100% of hospitals becoming financially weaker by the day. These are the numbers that matter most. These show how drastically things are changing. These are the numbers that are impacts hospitals, communities, caregivers, and patients. These are the metrics that deserve our collective policy attention at the moment. Our Commonwealth's long-term affordability goals will remain nearly impossible to reach until we resolve these fundamental on-the-ground pressures that we're facing today. To borrow from the HPC approach, it is clear that we need a PIP, but we need a performance improvement plan for the entire Commonwealth. It includes everything from health care planning to strengthening our workforce to doubling down on our commitment to health equity. But it also means modernizing our approach to how we measure access and affordability. We have to be able to include the real-time pressures that weren't imaginable in 2012. The statutorily required discussion that's taking place right here today at this moment is a relic of the past and it no longer serves our patients. Let's work together to create a transformative, sustainable, patient-centered system for the future. It will take intense collaboration between everyone who has the power to make a difference. Hospitals, payers, elected officials, the Health Policy Commission, advocates, and beyond. I remain deeply grateful for the work that is being done by the Commission, by the Healy Driscoll Administration, Executive Director Seltz, Executive Director Peters, by Secretary Walsh. It's time to lean in further. Now, our hospitals are committed to being a central driver of this partnership. And it is my hope at this hearing next year, we as a collective will have taken meaningful steps to make it happen. Thank you all for your support of our health care providers, for our workforce, for our patients, and for the communities that they all serve. Be happy to take any questions. Thank you for that testimony. Any questions for, yes, please. So I, a, a number of speakers, including in the, the presentation, have stressed um, that one of our big failures as a commonwealth is we have an invested outside of like the acute care sector into the home health sector, the nursing home sector, the personal care home health aid sector, and therefore that's just clogging up everything because there's nowhere for the patients to go. And I guess, and you mentioned that too, and so I understand you sort of said we need to look at everything. I want to know what you think we as a state can do specifically about that part, which is areas which have traditionally been very low wage areas of health care, where in the pandemic workers left, there's no obvious reason for workers to come back, there's lots of other sectors, the pay is really bad. How does that affect what we do, both with the benchmark in terms of targeting the benchmark, but also generally in your, in your assessment. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Collar. The person to, 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 to your um, uh, 
your left, my right, knows more about this than anybody else. And Commissioner Foley, it represents the very workers that you mm -hmm. have talked about. Um, there are a couple of factors in this. I've been Certainly, quizzing him about them, too. What's that? I've been quizzing him about yes. them, too. <laughs> um, Secretary Walsh it, it was, was, was on a call yesterday talking about um, some of the investments in behavioral health that need to be ta able, taking place in the workforce. It's a huge issue. Uh, Executive Director Seltz's slide on the continuum is, is really the picture. Right? When someone can't get out and someone presents in the emergency department, they can't be admitted into med surge and everything stops. And that's when your family, your friends, and your constituents are waiting for four, five, six hours. That's the basic fundamental problem. So the hospital community actually is in full support of investments into post-acute because it makes, it's the only thing that makes the system work, right? Senator Friedman, Chair Lawn, they've been talking about this as a continuum and investing in workforce. The challenge with workforce at the higher levels is it never reset after COVID. So we had temporary workers, we spent 1.8 billion on temporary workforce, and now the floor is higher than it once was, which has driven up all of the cost um, in terms of labor. And the folks that really deserve a pay increase are the low wage workers that are caring for us every day, taking care of our loved ones and coming back and doing it again, whether it be in the home or in the hospital. We have to invest financially in entry level jobs in order to help the entire continuum. And it's the people that, that Tim represents, and he's talked about this investment is critical to moving the system forward. It's always odd when I have conversations with incredible thought leaders, like the chairs, when we're talking about delivering, represent hospitals, but represent providers, but we really all represent patients. We're talking about a future system that doesn't deliver care in the hospital. That's the reality. We need to get people out of the hospital. It's delivery system transformation that's using technology. It's using artificial intelligence, it's using hospital at home, it's using telemedicine. Those are the policy levers that the legislature has been pushing and will need to continue to push if we're going to solve the capacity crisis and take care of our patients and have accessible, affordable health care. Other questions you, or comments for Steve Walsh? Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve, for coming to testify. Um, uh, and we now like to call Liz Leahy from the Massachusetts Association of Health Plants. <coughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Director Seltz, Chair DeVoe, HPC Commissioners, Chair Friedman, Chair Lawn, and members of the Healthcare Financing Committee. I'm Liz Leahy, Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Engagement at the Massachusetts Association of Health Plans. We represent 14 health plans and two behavioral health organizations that provide coverage to nearly 3 million Massachusetts residents. And on behalf of MAP, I'm here to offer our support for retaining a strong healthcare cost growth benchmark set at 3.6% for 2025. The cost growth benchmark is a key facet of the HPC's cost containment mission and it acts as a reminder that healthcare cost growth is a shared responsibility. And that reminder is really the crux of my testimony here today. The data from HPC and CHIA tells us a familiar story about the drivers of healthcare costs. The very same factors that have challenged our collective ability to meet the state's cost growth benchmark persist. Consistent increases in the prices that doctors, hospitals, and other providers charge often driven by market leverage rather than quality of care, care largely being delivered in, by high-cost providers in high-cost settings, and perhaps most significantly, excessive spending growth for prescription drugs, with ever-rising prices for specialty, branded, and generic medications. Health insurance premiums and cost sharing are a direct reflection of the cost of health care. When drug companies, hospitals, and providers raise their prices, employers and consumers bear those costs in their premiums and cost sharing. And without action to hold pharmaceutical manufacturers accountable to the benchmark or to rein in our highest cost providers, market-based solutions in place today have led to some of the affordability challenges that were highlighted in the presentations. For example, Increasing adoption of high deductible health plans is the result of employers and consumers making difficult decisions regarding health care coverage, since rich products with lower cost sharing come with higher monthly premiums. 
opting for high deductible health plans, which offer broader networks and lower premiums, are often a preferred alternative because the monthly premium is more affordable. Limited network products often don't offer the same broad networks that consumers are seeking. At the same time, efforts to erode fundamental health plan tools used to contain costs have cropped up again and again. Bills to limit or modify the use of utilization management, eliminate consumer cost sharing, or even prohibit carriers from referencing the cost growth benchmark in provider negotiations were filed this legislative session. Without these tools, health plans will be left with few resources to contain costs for the employers and consumers that they serve. And this isn't rhetoric. We routinely hear from health plan CEOs about negotiations with hospitals and providers seeking rate increases upwards of 20 to 30 percent year after year. I recently heard an anecdote about a provider group seeking 50 percent rate increases over the past three years. Without a strong benchmark and without accountability to that benchmark, health plans will have little leverage to constrain provider rates. Without cost sharing, particularly for prescription drugs, health plans have limited ways to guide consumers to lower cost but equally effective alternatives. And without utilization management, health plans will be unable to ensure that their members are receiving the right care at the right place and in the, at the right time. Healthcare affordability is the most significant challenge health plans are facing today. This has an immense impact on the employers and consumers that they serve. But health plans cannot fix the affordability challenge alone. All healthcare entities must be held accountable for cost growth. The pharmaceutical industry must report to the Health Policy Commission and participate in the annual cost trends hearing in the same manner that health plans and hospitals have for more than a decade. Constraints must be placed on high cost providers and all entities must be accountable to the performance improvement plan process, not simply health plans and primary care provider groups. Without this, measuring the affordability of health insurance premiums and cost sharing will only continue to reveal increasing unaffordability. If our goal as a commonwealth is to ensure that all residents have access to affordable, equitable, and high quality health care, it is time for all entities in the health care system to be accountable for lowering costs. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for, yes. Um, I would agree with everything you've said that all entities need to be accountable for their costs, but one of the slides that we looked at today showed that health insurance administrative costs have risen 50 percent since 2017, well above inflation. So what, do you, what is your organization and its members, what are they doing to look to reduce their administrative costs as insurers? Thank you for the question. Um, so I just want to point out that there are a number of regulatory and statutory constraints on administrative spending for health plans. Um, so um, uh, Director Seltz and um, Dr. Auerbach talked about medical loss ratios. So there is a requirement that health plans have to spend 88% of the premium dollar on direct medical care, and the remainder can go towards administrative spending. Um, we also have a cap on contribution to surplus at 1.9%, so health plans can't contribute they can't have excess profits going into reserves or profits to um, uh, shareholders uh, because we have a cap at 1.9 percent. And what that means is the Division of Insurance can disapprove health plan rates and health plans won't be able to put products out in the market if they're taking in more profit um, than 1.9 percent. That administrative spending increase is a reflection of increasing costs that everyone in the healthcare, and I, I would argue all, all of Massachusetts and the nation are facing. The impact of inflation on employee wage demands, benefits, um, salaries, that's included in the administrative spending. Um, we also have requirements around investments in IT infrastructure, so investing in information security. And then included in that chunk of administrative spending is also all of the stuff that health plans have to do to meet the needs of their consumers as directed by the legislature. So for example, we have um, laws that have required the standing up of robust provider directories. We have requirements around automating prior authorization. We 
we have requirements around how claims are transferred and, and sent to folks. And all of that requires significant IT investments, and that's included in that, in, uh, that administrative spending. Um, so I think, oh, and I'll also add, in the 2022 timeframe, you're also looking at the continued volatility of the COVID-19 pandemic and kind of the run out of all of the stuff that health plans stood up to help their employers uh, and the consumers that they serve, telehealth, um, consumer hotlines to get folks access to the right providers, uh, cash advances to providers during that time frame. So that's all coming out in that administrative spending chunk that you're seeing. And at the same time, health plans are looking for efficiencies. I think the biggest way that folks are seeking to increase administrative efficiencies is by moving away from manual outdated paper processes into a more uh, tech savvy future. So for example, automated prior authorization and robust online provider directories. Hi, so you spoke a lot about the one, the increase in demand for high deductible plans, it seems, as well as, you know, the use of high cost providers as some of the biggest factors driving up price increases. But can you speak a little bit to what health insurance plans are, are actually doing to reduce that premium growth? So what are some of the major efforts that health plans are taking to control costs? Just speaking from the health, health insurer perspective. Sure. Um, so health plans have a variety of tools used to constrain health care costs. Mm -hmm. I talked a little bit about utilization management, so programs to guide folks to the right care at the right place in the right time. Consumer cost sharing is also a tool that is used to direct consumers to lower cost but equally effective um, prescription drugs or sites of care. Um, and then provider negotiations, negotiations with providers, um, and being able to negotiate with systems to drive down the demands that we're seeing. I think one of the biggest challenges we face here in Massachusetts is the impact of market power on those negotiations with providers and the challenges that health plans are facing in negotiating low enough rates to kind of restrain that premium growth. Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing. I'm trying to think of other, other things that I would want to highlight to drive down premium costs. Utilization, I think that covers it. Okay. And then specifically around the topic of equity, um, to what extent are health plans really keeping track of um, both cost sharing rates and sort of out-of-pocket expenses um, and premiums across race ethnicity? as well as utilization, and what are you all doing with that data? Are you able to use that data to um, help improve equity in terms of access and the prices that consumers face? That's a great question. Um, so during the pandemic, on behalf of my organization... Liz, not to break your stride, but can you move the microphone a little bit to one side? We're having a little bit of trouble hearing, and let's just test that. How's that? Is that better? Good. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, during the pandemic, um, my organization pulled together a really comprehensive study of telehealth usage by race, ethnicity, geographic location, um, and income to understand how folks were uptaking telehealth during that time period with the absence of in-person care. Um, so that's, a, that's a, like a specific example of action that was taken just in one area. Um, through that project, we identified opportunities to improve collection of race, ethnicity, um, social determinants of health data, especially in the demographic data that health plans are collecting so that we can measure exactly what you're talking about, the impact of all of these different facets of our identities on your use of healthcare dollars, on your spending of uh, the healthcare premium and on consumer cost sharing. We're also working closely um, with state agencies that are improving data collection there. So as you know, MassHealth has undertaken a very big project to kind of advance the work that they're doing on collecting discrete measures of um, health equity. And then through um, an organization called the Mass Collaborative, we've developed these standard prior authorization forms, which is not exciting, but it, we have updated them to now include information that really targets um, some of those uh, demographic factors that will help us identify where folks are seeking care, who's being 
being impacted by utilization management, by consumer cost sharing, et cetera. Um, so I think the, the, the biggest step that health plans can take as essentially the holders of data across all of the patients that are in their membership accessing services is getting that data right and making sure that we have the right metrics to be tracking the impact um, that you speak of. Any other questions for Liz? Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, and thanks for bearing with us on the microphone. Appreciate your patience. Thank you very much. Good. And now let me call John Hurst from Real Tailors Association of Massachusetts. Welcome. Good afternoon, chairs, uh, committee members, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to come before you once again this year. My name is John Hurst. I'm president of the Retailers Association of Massachusetts. We're a statewide trade association of 4,000 businesses across the Commonwealth, primarily small operators, operating in one to two locations on average with about 10 employees. And year after year, uh, healthcare costs is the number one issue that our, our members come back to us on. And, it, and it's becoming an issue of competitiveness, and it's becoming an issue of equity. They're in a different place than large employers. And we're putting them less and less competitive with each passing year to attract a good workforce and retain a workforce uh, that keeps them uh, competitive and keeps their doors open. Uh, we come before you today uh, because we're asking you to, to rather than keep the 3.6% benchmark to lower it once again to 3.1, because the 3.6, frankly, is not working. It's not working for two reasons. First and foremost, the providers are ignoring it. Uh, they can't ignore it because there's no teeth to it. There's no ramifications. They're getting away with it. And number two, it's also, it, the, the way it's set up, including buying groups of you know, government, mass health, and, and the like. It really dilutes the reality of what's happening out there in the commercial marketplace, particularly for those small businesses that really are at the bottom of the totem pole and are really getting hammered out there uh, with premium increases year after year after year. And you know, the fact that really that we have a, a benchmark at all that includes all of these payers, it really tips the scales, frankly, uh, towards the provider and away from the consumer, the premium paying employer, uh, and the taxpayer. So we would urge you to go back to 3.1. Uh, we, every year we, we've been surveying our members what's happening with their premiums. And most of you know here in Massachusetts, small businesses typically renew their health care coverage in, in the time frame between January 1 and April 1. So these numbers are in. We just completed our survey of our 4,000 members and it came back with a 7.5% increase for 2024. We're not talking 2022 here, we're talking 2024. Current premium costs uh, that these small businesses are looking at. Um, beyond that, you know, if, you, you know if, if this was a one year anomaly, it'd be one thing, but it's not. Over the 10 years, our average increase number was 9.7. You compare that to Large buying groups like, like the GIC, they do a great job. Their, their average increase is about 4.6%. The average of the inflation rate over that 10 years is 2.9%. All compared to a cost bench, benchmark of either 3.1 or 3.6%. There's something wrong here. Uh, there's something wrong with the law. There's something wrong with the marketplace. And we did want to survey our members for some other things. We, you know, we, there were some things happening in the marketplace, uh, the redeterminations for one, the expansion of uh, the connector care. We wanted to see what was happening with their take-up rates. Uh, we, so we asked the question, um, first of all, a majority of our members uh, are at, on 53% are at high deductible plans. Uh, that seems to be growing. And as far as the take-up rates, it, it's really very low as far as what makes them competitive against a large employer. It came back at 49.5%. Now, compared to the prior year, 
64% uh, saw no change in participation rate versus the prior year. 15% uh, saw reduced participation rates, and 22% saw an increase in participation rate. How much of that might be redeterminations, we don't know, but I suspect some of it might be that. Uh, but once again, people, employees are looking for alternatives. They're going to, whether it's a spouse's plan, a parent's plan, uh, maybe a larger employer, uh, that gives them greater value. Uh, the, the younger employees, some of them may be going to the connector to get the taxpayer subsidy uh, support. And increasingly, small businesses are leaving the merge market entirely, going to stop loss plans or PEO plans in order to help them manage their claims uh, and manage, see real results from their workforces through wellness programs and transparency usage, uh, the proper value for the location for the services, and see those results in their future premiums. Unfortunately, that doesn't work today in, 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 uh, in the merge marketplace. So we see providers pushing unaffordable medical inflation through higher commercial reimbursement rates, higher taxpayer funding, uh, expansion of state mandated benefits, which we know disproportionately hits small businesses versus large ERISA exempt uh, businesses. And we need to do something about it. Some, the, the law is flawed. Uh, clearly, we have neither uh, strong competition. Every marketplace to pr protect a consumer either needs strong competition or strong regulation, and we really have neither. Uh, we could have strong competition if we had real transparency, real tra transparency of what's happening in those contracts, what's happening with, with the payroll and, and uh, financial ratios and actual utilization for services in, in various locations. Or we could have stronger regulation that puts some teeth behind the benchmark. But until we have one or the other or a combination of both, we have to use the tools that are available to us. And the only one that we have is going back to 3.1% on the benchmark. And we would urge the HBC to do exactly that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Question? Th thank you, John, very much for your testimony. Quick question. The 7.4% the, the premium increase that you talked about? 7.5. 7.5. Yep. Didn't mean to jip you. Uh, 7.5 premium, how much of that was passed along to the employees? Did you, did you study that at all? Or, and how much was uh, the, the small business absorbed? Yeah, typically our members, uh, we, we, we've, we've, uh, the surveys come back at about 75% employer versus employee co cost share on the premium. Now, of course, keep in mind, as, as high deductible plans become more and more prevalent, there are other ways that things are getting sh shifted onto those employees, and that makes gives them more financial incentive to look at other, other alternatives. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Michael Caljo from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi. Great, Mike. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Secretary Walsh, Chairs DeVoe, Friedman and Lawn, Directors Seltz and Peters, and Honorable Representatives and Senators, and other public policy leaders. I'm Mike Caljo. I'm the Vice President for State and Federal Government and Regulatory Affairs at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. I appreciate the opportunity to present our thoughts to you today on the health care cost growth benchmark for total health care expenditures for calendar year 2025. Blue Cross is proud to be a local not-for-profit health plan rooted in our local community, partnering with our provider colleagues in so many ways to ensure that our three million members and tens of thousands of employer accounts continue to get the best care possible, especially at this very fragile time. As we continue to discuss the important issues of affordability, we are ever mindful of our co continued responsibility to address health equity and the workforce capacity demands with continued advancements across the industry at the forefront of the health care needs of our members. Blue Cross strongly supports the HPC's and legislature's work shining a spotlight 
on Massachusetts health care cost growth. As health care costs continue to increase, employers and individuals both continue to feel greater financial impacts over time. Our collective affordability efforts require greater urgency and collaboration across the Commonwealth. First of all, we must remember the cumulative impact of the numerous challenges that COVID-19 spurred as we consider the state's ability to meet the benchmark. Accordingly, Blue Cross recommends that the HPC continues to use a multi-year trend view when analyzing the benchmark during this particular period. With that discretion in mind, however, total spending in 2022 shows very troubling year-over-year -year growth with a per capita trend of 5.8% from 21 to 22. This represents the fastest year-over-year -year growth, excluding the year of 2020 to 2021, since Chia began measuring total health expenditures. Perhaps more importantly, the five-year TMA growth trend is also above benchmark, where before it was under the benchmark for a similar five-year period. <clears throat> there are consistent and quite problematic growth trends in pharmacy and hospital outpatient costs. Among the claims-based serv service categories, pharmacy, both gross and net of rebate, showed the fastest growth during this period. The continued upward trajectory in healthcare spending is concerning. In its 2023 report, the HPC found that from 19 to 21, the average commercial spending rate in Massachusetts was 5.8, a faster rate than the rest of the U.S. The fastest rate of growth was again observed in pharmacy, followed by hospital outpatient and ambulatory surgical centers combined. Drivers of excess spending related to prices included unwarranted utilization and low value of care, but low value care. These findings and the troubling report this week from Chia underscore the need for increased scrutiny, not diminished scrutiny. As such, the Commonwealth should maintain its cost benchmark at 3.6. Additionally, the benchmark should test not only health plans and doctors, but hospitals, healthcare systems, pharmaceutical companies, and pharmacy benefit managers. As the HPC considers an affordability index to complement the cost growth benchmark, we ask that you correct these exclusions. Health plans alone should not be held accountable for affordability. It is a responsibility for all involved, especially in those areas that are driving growth. Simply put, a heightened role for the HPC is the underpinning of a more functional, more affordable health care system in Massachusetts. As such, we must update these specific governmental tools for cost containment. The state should expand the entities that are subject to measurement against the benchmark to provide a more complete market analysis and deeper examination of the identified cost issues. Also, a hospital and health system efficiency measure would assist the HPC in monitoring costs. The state should modernize its approach to hospital and health system expansions by coordinating the work of the HPC, CHIA, and the Department of Public Health. A comprehensive analysis by the HPC during the DON process, similar to its cost and market impact analysis, will endure cost effective, high, ensure rather, cost effective high quality health care across the state. Additional stakeholder commentary is also an important part to this goal. Additionally, the state should consider oversight for new types of care, including hospital at home. These types of programs can dramatically increase capacity, and they're often within larger, higher-priced systems. They currently do not require a DON filing or material change notice, and as such, as the state modernized the view of the healthcare system, new approaches to those expansions should also be included. Lastly, the performance improvement plan process at the Health Policy Commission should be considered to be an increasingly important tool. Used with the discretion noted above, and as the HPC has used that discretion in the past, additional PIP processes in subsequent monitoring and enforcement of PIPs would be strong regulatory signals to the market that the Commonwealth is indeed serious in its effort to reduce costs. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. 
Thank you, Mike. Questions for Mr. Cowjo? Great. Thank you for your testimony. Chris Carlosi from the National Federation of Independent Business. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you to the commission. Thank you to the committee. My name is Christopher Carlosi, and I'm the Massachusetts Director of the National Federation of Independent Business, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We are the nation's and the state's largest small business advocacy group. In Massachusetts, we represent thousands of small and independent business owners involved in all types of industry, including manufacturing, retail, wholesale, service, and agriculture. The average NFIB member has five employees and annual gross revenues of about $450,000. In short, we represent the small Main Street business owner from across our state. This may sound like a little bit of an echo. I know the echo in the room today is a, uh, is a common theme, but a little bit of an echo to what John had said earlier, but I feel it bears repeating to some degree. Every four years, NFIB surveys our small business members nationwide to determine our list of problems and priorities. For more than 29 years, the cost of health care has topped that list. At the time of the survey back in 2020, we'll have another one coming out in 2024 later this year, premium costs had risen more than 40% over the course of a decade for employers offering coverage. A completely unsustainable scenario on, for both businesses' bottom lines and the employer's ability to attract workers. Unfortunately, the challenge to offer affordable health plans to workers is not the only problem small businesses face right now. To paint a holistic picture of what small employers are dealing with, according to our research foundation's latest optimism index, some conditions are improving, but 37% of employers still have open positions. Of those 56 trying to hire for their open positions, 91% struggle to find qualified workers, similar to what we're hearing in the healthcare fields. 37% are also reporting higher selling prices due to inflation. 35% of owners raise compensation, with another 19% planning to do so over the next couple months. And according to Wallet Hub, Massachusetts had the fifth highest energy costs in the nation. And according to the Tax Foundation, Massachusetts is 46th in the nation for business tax climate, including 50th in the nation for unemployment taxes. We cannot allow Massachusetts to continue to be one of the highest cost states for health expenses, too. Every year, we come to this hearing and report small business cost growth far exceeds the growth benchmark, which is usually under or around the intended goal. This year, the prospect of growth above the benchmark is alarming and likely higher for employers struggling to offer affordable and quality coverage. And while we did not hold our annual survey to ask how much their premiums rose this year, it usually falls between 11 to 13 percent. Anecdotally, I hear from business owners in every sector in industry running out of options as the cost of care becomes less and less attainable for smaller businesses. This acts as a hiring challenge in this hyper-competitive labor market where employers need a robust benefit package to attract workers. As David mentioned earlier in, in, in the slides that were being presented, our members are being forced to present prospective and current employees with increased cost sharing, high deductibles, and more out-of-pocket costs not the most appealing offer for a worker seeking employment. And when the cost of offering health insurance rises, it means a reduction in other per perks in offered to their workforce. Whether that be 401ks, time off, or fringe benefits, small business budgets are only so big. These small manufacturers, shops, hotels, and service providers are often excellent places to work and provide flexibility and the best fit for workers in the state but they must have more options that work with their budgets and their workers' budgets for health care. Right now, they're being priced out of the insurance markets. They continue to say it's only getting worse. We really need to take a harder look at what Massachusetts' unique merged market means for smaller employers. What is the impact? Why do they experience double-digit premium increases almost annually? What affected the phasing out of the ratings factors that once served as guardrails to prevent premium spikes have on smaller businesses in the market? Is there cross-subsidizing going on within the market that is leading to small employers at a disadvantage? These questions must be answered. We must also examine what happened to policies that were supposed to provide cost savings. Telehealth was once billed as a tool that would reduce overhead costs. Then the state passed reimbursement parity. Every session, there is a flurry of new mandates that are offered and sold as only a few dollars more. 
but those costs add up, especially for the smaller employers. The big self-insured plans don't have to worry about the expense of all those new mandates, yet small businesses in the market are now forced to absorb the cost. We must look at these cost drivers as small businesses are dropping their coverage. In the past, I jokingly read the same testimony year after year because nothing had changed for those small businesses. But it seemed this year it was more dire in the, as we try to control costs for those employers. Massachusetts faces a long list of affordability challenges for both residents and employers. And health care expenses, they're at the top of that list. If we are serious about making the state more competitive, we must start to rein in costs for our smallest employers so they too can offer their workforce an affordable and quality health insurance benefit like larger employers in the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Chris? Thank you. Thank you. Eileen McEnany? Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm Eileen McEnany, and today I'm testifying as a private citizen and a consumer of health care. Soon, though, I will be a representative of an employer coalition focused on affordable health care, but I also bring 30 years of experience as a public policy professional representing employers and the taxpayers in many of those years focused on health care policy. And I'm going to provide you some written remarks, and I know that the hour is late, so I really just want to make four points. And the first one really is just a reminder about the context in in which the initial cost benchmark was established. Um, at that time, there was a significant difference of opinion about where it should be set. And as a representative of the employer community at that time, we had argued that it should actually be negative. Given that there was a lot of data to support that 30 percent of health care was either inappropriate or um, or not effective. And so it was really about putting a stake in the ground. As you are all aware, that isn't what happened. It's a growth benchmark. But even given that, as you've heard, we've also missed that mark for many years. And it was set at a rate that exceeded inflation and wage growth. And so we, we're seeing health care grow at a rate, um, at a faster rate than the economy as a whole. And I think that that has real consequences for Massachusetts. But the second aspect of the cost benchmark that, that I would talk about is really the use of the potential state gross product. By design, it, it's, it's designed to even out cost over time. But that masks some of the very real cost pressures that, that employers and individuals and taxpayers are facing as of late. And so, I mean, we all know about the sticker shock at the grocery store. We all know about the high interest rates. But employers in Massachusetts have a lot of cost in addition to that. They're looking at the wage increase pressures. They're looking at some of the highest energy costs in the country. They're looking at some of the highest, if not the highest, unemployment insurance rates. They're looking at some programs that only a handful of states have, a like, like a paid family and medical leave. And, and so these cost pressures are, are real, and I ask you as you think about the benchmark to think about it in that more macroeconomic context. The other hat I wear is a commissioner of the group insurance. And we just approved rates that on average will increase by 8.5%. And the Group Insurance Commission, at least at one time, was the largest purchaser in New England. And so if the Group Insurance Commission is looking at those rates, the rates for small businesses are astronomical. And so the third point is that we really have to address this affordability with a renewed sense of urgency because um, it's been 18 years since Chapter 58 was enacted. In, in cost containment and in, in affordability of cost was one of the three stools in the triangle 
that, that, that was the promise of Chapter 58. It was about increased access, and we've had some success. It was about improved quality, and I think that's an ongoing effort. But this, this affordability does remain elusive. And I would say there are a lot of um, consequences to our inaction. You've heard about some of them today, but certainly there's less discretionary income for households. There is less money available to in, to, for equipment or new hires for businesses. And increasingly, um, there's a significant price tag for taxpayers because health care consumes more and more of the state budget, but it leaves less money available for some of the other determinants of health. And, and so I, I really think it's important. We also are aware Massachusetts is experiencing a loss of population. We're experiencing um, some out-migration, and a lot of that has to do with the unaffordability of the Commonwealth. And the final point I'll make is I think the Healy administration is rightfully laser focused on affordability, on competitiveness, and on equity. And I would say um, taking steps to address healthcare affordability, in my mind, would be the single biggest thing you could do to address all three. Uh, happy to answer any questions, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Questions or comments for Eileen? Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the public testimony for those who signed up in advance of the hearing to come in person. Um, I don't want to short circuit the previous discussion that we paused um, on the presentation, so can I open it back up to my colleagues? If there were any other questions, our directors are, um, and Dr. Auerbach are still here. Any other last questions of the day? Everyone's. All right, great. Well, please. So I'm just. You know, I continue being struck as at our annual hearings about how much people say we need to make costs go down, but we're still not getting there. You know, we're still, yeah. it's like we're kind of rowing into the storm, and no matter how hard we try, we seem to either go nowhere or go backwards. And so it just, I don't know, partly it's frustrating and partly it's invigorating because we just have to keep trying harder, but I feel like I hear this and I process all this and I keep saying, what more should we be doing than we're doing now? And the answer can't be nothing because we're not, that, that's an unacceptable answer. Um, and I just want to keep, as a commission, working towards what is the right answer in that circumstance. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I think the recommendations of the commission and the discussion that's happened over the course of this year are really critical to our path going forward because without some change, I am concerned as you are that we will not be able to address the challenges we're facing in a way that's as meaningful as what we're hearing today um, is necessary. Thank you for that comment. Others? Well, with that, I want to provide those, I want to thank those who provided the public testimony today and those who are here um, listening and participating, as well as the Health Policy Commissioners, Senator Friedman, Representative Lawn, and the members of the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing. This is a critical part of our deliberations, and the um, input received today was very valuable. The HPC Board is going to meet on Thursday, April 11th, to discuss the findings presented at today's hearing and the testimony and to take a vote to establish the healthcare cost growth benchmark for 2025. Of course, that meeting is public and live streamed on our YouTube channel for those who are looking to tune in. And with that, thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>